hell? Welcome back, good folks of the internet, of the Matrix. You are back at another episode of Making Music with me, Mike Pepe. And welcome back to Studio C at legendary Barefoot Recordings in Hollywood, California. Right in the heart of it, baby. That's right. Um, I hope everyone's been enjoying the videos. We've got some guitar stuff up there now. We got some kick drum, some snare drum. And today, oh boy, I know you're already clicking the video, so you're 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 wanting the good stuff. We're talking about bass dissection. That's right, recording and producing bass. And uh man, this is just so this one I've been looking forward to for a while because I I just feel that low end in rock music specifically because that's what I produce um, is just so important and every record is so different. The low end is just so radically different every rock record uh, out there. And it's because gear and player makes a, such a huge difference. I say it all the time on this channel um, and I mean it. You start with a good part you start with a good player, you get the right gear, and and you give that player the right gear, and uh, things come together. But no, I don't think it's any more truer than when we're talking about low end um, and the bass guitar, the four string magic baby. Um, yeah, just it's 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 like it holds down the record. It's one of the only things, as I say that sits in the middle of your track consistently. Typically, anyway. Kick, snare, bass, vocal. That is typically right, somewhere right up the middle, very close to being right up the middle of the mix. Those are the elements that are going to be really holding down, you know, the, the, the anchor of the track, right? So we have here... Um, well, actually, I hope everyone's doing okay today. First of all, you know, I I, uh, I always get right into, I try and get right into things, but uh, I also like to chit chat a little bit uh, and have a little podcast sort of thing. I, I had a great day today. I had a great uh, writing session with an artist. Uh, wrote a, a great uh, song. Feel really good about it. Tomorrow, I'm back into mixes. Uh, sa or Friday and Saturday. I'm sorry, Thursday and Friday uh, and Saturday too, for that matter. And then I start on a record uh, next week. And March is going to be busy. I'm can't wait. Have some really, really good music to produce in March. Very excited. Uh, as you can see, it's 7.23 up here. Because, uh, again, as usual, I didn't hide my tool bar. I actually, I think, to hide the tool bar, I looked it up, you have to go into full screen mode, and I don't think Pro Tools currently has full screen mode. I might be wrong on that. If I am, let me know, uh, please, because I would love to hide my tool bar when I do these. Not that it matters, really, I guess. Whatever. Um, anyway, yeah, hope everything, everybody's doing good, man. Uh, I don't know if anybody follows, uh, crypto stuff, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and stuff, but that's been quite the story this past week. Uh, when I'm shooting this, it has just been volatile. I mean, crazy numbers, especially in Bitcoin. Uh, very interesting to see that all happen. So anyway, another thing of, of interest to me, um, I love watching the, uh, there's some guy named BitBoy on uh, on on YouTube, and he does a great show. I I, I enjoy his uh, I enjoy his shows. Um, so anyway, I have my list of notes here. I know what we're doing, and it's gonna be fun. This is one of those episodes where low end. This is not gonna be an episode you want to watch on an iPhone. Uh, this is gonna be one you want to pop in some headphones for, or sit in front of some monitors, and just give it the old listen, the old watcheroo, because. Um, you're not gonna probably hear a whole lot of the 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 differences I'm getting ready to go over. Um, probably not gonna hear a whole lot of them on an iPhone. Just saying. Not that you can't hear bass on an iPhone, but the the nuanced differences that we're gonna be going over in low end theory here is not gonna come through very well on an iPhone. So uh, just a kind of a you know forewarning or whatever like this, this is gonna be very you know we're gonna be talking about bass guitars the whole time here. So. Um, yeah, why don't we get started? So I opened up a, uh, a bass track by my very good friend, um, Orion, uh, Salazar. What's up, dude? Shout out, my guy. He is one of the most incredible bassists I've ever had the pleasure of working with and honor of working with. He is an incredibly accomplished musician. If, if you don't know him, look him up. 
Um, he was, uh, you know, uh, he was the original bassist in Third Eye Blind, and he did, um, which is one of my favorite bands ever, by the way. Uh, he did the first three or four records with them, I think. So, yeah, like the, yeah, you know, the ones. Uh, and he played uh, bass on this record that I produced last year. Uh, he's a great session guy, one of my go-tos. Like I said, one of the best musicians, really. He's just through and through. What a sweet guy and an amazing player. Um, so I'm going to let us play a little bit. I'm, 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 I'm going to play a little bit of this track that we're going to analyze. I put the drums in here, too, because I think it's really important. Whenever I talk about bass guitar, um, it's really important to talk about drums, too, because they are... Uh, married, you know, I like to say they they are they are married, man. They got rings on each other's fingers, you know, for life, son. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna be listening to the drum stems and the bass stem that's already been printed, finished, you know, all that stuff mixed the whole nine yards. This is this is the rhythm section from the song that I pulled. Uh, the stems that were that are finished as they appeared on the record of the mix that 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 got that went to mastering. So let's play this a little bit. I'm gonna play through the pre-chorus because the pre-chorus has this sweet sweet bass part that I really want to uh, hammer out because it was uh it 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 was one of the main uh, points of me making a lot of decisions on the gear that we use for the song was that there there was a part in the pre-chorus that I thought was a very indicative of what this song was about and a lot of what the part was about. So here we go. Let's take a listen. Uh, yeah. Okay, that is that is a freaking groove, man. It really is. The the part of the prequels I was talking about, you 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 probably could pick it up, but here, here it is again. That part is so sick. Um man, he killed that part too. It's it's so good. But that that part, the ba da 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 part, that uh really helped me shape during pre-production when we we're going through these songs, shape what I thought the bass should sound like for this song. Um, because I felt as though it was gonna be and and if you and in this mix it was a very important part of that pre-course. It was very indicative of the of that section. I think it would kind of identify that section for me um in the mix itself and in the song. Um so let's go over a little bit what we did here. Uh first of all, you could hear how the low end and the drums were really married, especially that kick drum specifically. When we're talking about it, um, and we'll go over through. Oh, go over some some of the EQ moves I did on the bass. The drums I only have the overarching moves I did, so we can go over that. But really, I was probably cutting holes in the drums. Uh, I mean, not probably. I was cutting holes in the drums way earlier than by the time we get to the stems. When I'm just doing little bits of EQ work, so we won't be able to see that. But but we will be able to see what I did. Um, on the bass to get it to sit like that. So, uh, first of all, let me go ahead and mute this the stem out and open up the individual tracks here. Let's do this. There we go. Okay. Come like that. Okay. And I had a note in my snapshot here that uh, going to the unfair child, it was the bus, uh, the bass bus was set to down six. No plugins were sent. So, in other words, we should be monitoring what these off is basically what I'm telling myself. Because uh, as I was mixing the individual uh, microphones, I didn't, I, I, uh, these didn't go to the, to the, to the unfair child to be printed. Uh, these were only applied after, based on whatever the stem was. So we're gonna keep these off for the time being. We'll turn them back on later. Make sure my round is good here. Yep. Okay. And actually. We should be putting this through. There we go. I'll change this so that's not going through the uh, through the mix bus yet because that's uh, not how I was listening to it as I was getting the faders up. I'm basically trying to recreate how this was uh, while I was mixing. So in other words, I don't want the plugins on that I ended up using. I don't want it going through the 
on Fairchild right now because I didn't listen to that that way originally. You know, uh, while I was doing the mixing, I want I want to recreate that, and, and eventually we'll get there. I want to take you to the process of how we went there. Uh, and a step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and how it got to the unfair child, and then what it sounded like coming back, and all that stuff. That's very important because this is a process, you know. Um, I don't want to cheat you by li- having you hear something just just sounds cool right away. Like it, it. I think it's. I think the tone we got sounds really good, um, but it it took work to, and EQing and compression to get it to where it sound like just now. And and I want to make sure we go over all those steps. Uh, as you might have guessed. None of the stuff that I do uh, is not detail oriented. So we can see here I have five bass tracks. I'm a little thirsty. Here we go. Ah, oh yeah, oh yeah, baby. I'm hydrated now. Um, actually, I'll take this out of the mix bus for a moment too. There we go. Okay. So um, let's open these tracks up here first of all. We have on the cabinet, this was an Ampeg SVT, that guy up there actually, we'll go over that in a minute, through my SVT, uh, my, through my 8x10E, which is the most rock and roll son of a bitch ever. Um, and on the, on the cabinet, we had, uh, I had a base D112, I, um, I said base D112, I'm reading this exactly, I had a D112. I had a 421, had an SM7, an M81, and then a straight DI signal. Cool. Okay. So I'm looking at my notes here. You know, I got to stay focused. I got to stay focused. And the notes help me do that. So let's go ahead. Yeah, you know what? Let's look at the, let's listen to each one, how it came in. Let's turn these plugins off here. Uh, yeah, there we go. Approach is thinking. Oh, God, is it going to crash? No, it's not going to crash. Okay. I thought it was going to crash for a second. That would have been just embarrassing. Um, okay. So this was the D112. Let's listen to this individually. <laughs> Bring on Master Fader 2 for this so we have a metering. There you go. Very cool. This is the 421. SM7. M81. And the DI. Now you can tell already, all of these signals sounded sound way different way different every microphone every signal sounds way different um and those choices were made on purpose so that they can all blend together to become one so let's go through each one let's first of all i got some good pictures up here folks i got all kinds of goodies for us today oh my gosh i got pictures i got documentation i got all the good stuff to hear this bass track i mean it is really happening actually really fast why don't we listen to this no, we won't listen to it solo. We listen to the drums earlier. We, we'll listen to the bass solo later after we go through all the stuff. So, um, here we go. Oh, yeah. Now, tell me you haven't seen something more beautiful than that. Just just try. Try to tell me. I don't, I, you know, I don't know if you can. Because that is a, but you, it's a full thing. Uh, that was, I put the, uh, for these sessions, I had the cabinet uh, the, the 8x10, my 8x10 in the Studio A live room, as you can see. Well, I guess if you haven't been to Barefoot, that's a Studio A live room, or at least part of it. Um, and I had it in there. Looks like I'm miking up. Um, uh, yeah, these guys up here. So I didn't do the, oh, it doesn't look like I did the bottom, which I usually don't. Um, and I didn't do the very top, uh, the very top mainly just because they're higher, uh, and it's harder to correlate phase because you have to just look f- like literally farther down uh, the cabinet if uh, if you have ones up here and all the way down here. So usually what I do is I mic up the middle four, which is what this is, um, and I leave the top two and the bottom two, um, or the bottom, I guess the top two, I'm bad at math, but whatever it is, 
the middle four is what I make up, is is whatever is is what I uh is what I mic up. So we can see here D one twelve up on the left, four twenty one, so channel one, two, three, four as I had it going. So there we go. Look at another angle of it here. Very cool. Um you can see that this is uh <laughs> These guys are close. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're right on the friggin' grill. And man, it never fails to amaze me how much SPL and punishment these microphones can take. I mean, it's... That thing is so friggin' loud, and I mean, the capsules are right on there. I mean, I know, you know, you think after 15 plus years of doing this, this wouldn't amaze me anymore, but I mean... A human probably couldn't be in that room. I mean, you could be, but it would be, uh, to say uncomfortable would be an understatement. And those mics are right up. I mean, they're they're on top of it. It's like a freaking jet engine, that thing, as, as loud as probably uh, what the SPO is pushing. Um, anyway, you can see here, these uh, are all because, again, I have an SM7B in the mix. What I'm talking right now. Anytime there's an SM7B in the mix on a cabinet, or being mic'd up, you have to align it with the SM7's capsule. Or not have to, but I mean, I use that as my guidance point for phase because, as you can see here, the capsule is pushed back from the uh, from the head of the capsule uh, from the head of the of the actual uh, uh, in, uh, enclosure. The capsule doesn't start until right there. So um, basically. All of these capsules on these microphones are right against their grill, their front grill. So in other words, all of these capsules are right at right 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 against there. So you can see here, that guy's like that. I mean, honestly, this picture's not like the best, but um, you can see this guy's gonna be lined up. The front of that's gonna be lined up there, and then this guy's gonna be lined up there. So that'll ensure uh, our face to be aligned. If you want, let's take a look actually in the session and check my phase oh let's check my phase that'll do a good job let's see let's see i hope i did otherwise i'm gonna be awfully embarrassed let's see here up the waveforms yeah i mean you know the di obviously i shifted around a little bit to be probably in phase once it was done um because the di doesn't have any correlation to the microphones at all um so it's either gonna be in or out um and looks like it's Probably more out there, so I might have flipped it on the on the EQ itself, or I might have flipped it later. I don't know. We'll find out, I guess, as we go through this, you know? In any case, uh, the microphones themselves, which is really what we're focusing on, are all in phase, oh, baby. And I, that's, that's pretty, too. I got to tell you, I mean, you know, if we're talking about pretty, that's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty stuff. Uh, the only thing prettier is the way it sounds. Am I right? Okay, so, um, there we go. So, uh, that was the microphone arrangement on the cabinet. Cabinet again. I'll zoom out again so you can kind of see. There we go. There we go. Okay, cool. And now, uh, this was the base setting on my Ampeg head. There we go. Um, man, do I just... Love an Ampeg SVT, I gotta tell you. I mean, it is just, there's no doubt in the world that it is special. I mean, they just are, you know, especially uh, uh, my SVT head and cabinet are a matched pair, which is always, to me, you know, I'm not a bass aficionado in the sense of like, I'm not a collector, I'm not a, just a, I love bass, bass and the gear, but I'm not like, there's guys that just collect this stuff. I've been told that matched pairs are supposed to be better, which makes sense to me only because that's how like microphones are. Like if you're buying a pair of, um, like if you're buying a pair of microphones, um, getting a matched pair is always better because they're just like, if it's 101 and 102, you know those capsules are going to be very close to each other and sound relatively the same rather than if you get 101 and say 710. Uh, consistency should be the same, but you know, there's differences that happen and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, I've been told getting a matched pair is better, so I have a matched SVT head and a ten eight by uh, a ten E cabinet. Um, you can see I'm actually not pushing the volume that hard, but it is so loud that thing. I mean, it is crazy. I don't even know how you would 
record or play anything above like five. I think I've turned it up to five or six before if I just want to get insanely growly and just like, just blow up the fucking building. Oh, Ooh, I cursed. Okay, well, it is what it is. Sorry. I, I always mark these aren't for kids because there's, you know, well, I don't know any kids that want to watch me talk about bass guitars, but specifically also because I apparently I curse. So um, anyway, these guys, um, one of the best parts about SVTs to me are the EQ sections. So not only are these, not only does the EQ just sound good and, and very reflective of, of where we're turning and, and every knot sort of has a, has a sound to it. In other words, like you can really feel yourself going from zero to 10. You know, there's some heads that I feel as if as you're turning it, you're like every few markings you're hearing a difference. Like SVTs to me, the, the, the detail is in the EQ is always there. If I'm turning the treble up from one to nine or zero to 10, I'm hearing every spin of that dial happen in the mid range and so far and so forth. So anyway, but then we also have these switches, which are just absolutely just amazing. I, I don't necessarily, I, I don't know where they live in the EQ section, except the mid range, obviously, because it's labeled on this one. But ultra high, which I have on for this, gives us this super top end presence. It's Freaking amazing. I don't know what it is. It, to me, it feels like somewhere around 3.2 all the way up to maybe 6K. There's like, like this nice, healthy, just car, this, this nice, healthy umbrella that happened there. And man, it sounds so good. And you can hear on this bass. Uh oh. Uh oh. I got to reroute this. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Let me play this out of 3 4 again. This guy. Especially in the pre-chorus, that part that I was talking about. You hear that, that I don't want to call it sizzly, because that's actually almost like a negative word for it. But that top-end presence, that, that top-end boost that happens, it's like you can feel Orion's fingers on the fretboard. You can hear him going up and down. Like, the detail is absolutely manic. It's crazy. It really is. Oh, anyway, I, and, and I didn't even have the plugins on either that time, which is fine. I mean, whatever, just some compression, a couple of dBs or whatever. But, man, it is just so sick. Um, and then we get to our mid-range. Now, th this one's not really, uh, I mean, this isn't as extreme as these are, but you, you basically feel uh, essentially where that mid-range knob is centered at, right? So, in other words, rather than the ultra-high and the ultra-low, which are just either, uh, they're either... Uh, on or off the mid range actually these are just choices where where you're kind of centering your what I would call maybe your like your Q section or whatever you, you know what I mean um so 220 um definitely did not want to boost this on this guy I mean I'm not a huge fan of 200 anyway but I will use that setting like if we're doing like you know some finger picking, more jazzy, slower tempo stuff. I'll kind of use that mid range setting to kind of center it there because I want more fluffy stuff. Like if there's like, in other words, like a great example of when I would center the mid range of 220 on the Ampeg would be if there was like a felt beater drum set, right? If like the drum set has a felt beater and we're getting real puffy Nashville sort of stuff, I'll kind of, and you know, there's a finger player going on, I'll go to 220 and kind of tweak from there. 800 is an interesting one because I feel like 800 is actually like, creme de la crap when it comes to a real bass guitar that's like one of the biggest frequency ranges that i want a bass to take up so obviously ampeg has uh no surprise thought very long and hard about where to center these um that's not a surprise 220 wasn't a random number somebody came up with there was a there's a reason for that 800 same thing um i use i use the 800 setting a lot actually even with like picked basses or just like rock songs because i feel like um i'm not a like in guitars 800 isn't necessarily especially in the genre that I'm in, 800 isn't necessarily going to be like the thing, you know? Usually, like, we kind of want more like buzzsaw, like really present top ending guitars, you know, like high mid stuff. So um, usually having the bass sit around 800 can really fill out the track because it's filling up a frequency that it completely voided in the guitars. Now, in this specific guy, again, really based around a lot of that sound of the pre-chorus, I chose 3K as being my center. Because I really wanted that that mid-range push, 
that punchy top end, like I'm a bass and I'm here to friggin' rock. I mean, it is unapologetic, you know, that 3K. And I have it cranked, you can see, all the way up to 7, 7, a little bit over 7. So I, I'm sending at 3K and, and I'm just punching it out to 3, uh, uh, um, way over 7. So, I mean, you're hearing that mid range. And again, let's, let's take a listen to that again. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn on these plugins this time. Oh, whoa, Pro Tools did have a little thing. Look at that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. How's best of us? Oh, yeah, okay, whatever. But you can really hear, like, not only is the top end boost happening, you know, the ultra high setting that I love so much, you hear the scissor that, but then you also hear that really punchy mid-range in the bass. Like, you hear exactly all that high stuff he's playing and all the fretboard stuff he's doing. You hear that. Ultra low setting, um, that shit's crazy to me, honestly. Like, I, actually, if someone from Ampeg wants to reach out to me, I want to talk to them because I want to know what kind of, which magic that ultra low thing is doing. Um, it's like, I, I use ultra low a lot because I think in modern rock music, you need a healthy amount of, I don't want to say, well, yes, yeah, so, yeah, I'll say it's sub. Yeah, like, you, you know, really need a healthy amount of like 70 like 60 to 80, I guess would be kind of a good way to say it, 60 to 90. Um, it's very important, you know, to kind of keep up with trends right now to feel, to make your blowing feel modern. You really need some of that subby stuff. And that ultra low setting, when you turn it on, like I have it on there, it it's like it almost adds, I know it doesn't do this, so don't, and nobody come screwing up in the comments, like that's not what it does. I know it's not what it does, what I'm getting ready to say, but it, sound, it feels like it. It's almost like it adds the sub octave or something to the bass. Where you're just all of a sudden, when that turns, like the bass sounds good, and then you turn ultra low on, you're like, holy shit, now we got a bass. Um, and it's kind of hard to explain. I actually should have put an example in this session of one that I don't have ultra low on, one that I do have ultra low on, because it's something you got to really hear to believe. But it is really cool, and I have a tendency to keep it on a lot, especially with, like I said, with the modern rock bands I'm doing, you know, we want a healthy amount of low end in there, you know? Um, so yeah, that adds a healthy amount of 60 to 90 and it's controlled and you can see I'm boosting it all the way up past seven again, you know, um, like it looks like seven and a half, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm boosting it. And not only do I have the ultra engagement, but I'm boosting a lot of it. So let's listen to that again. Actually, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the chorus because I think this is where he kind of goes low on the, on the part. That part, man, Orion, this part is so good, dude. We worked in this bass line. I mean, this this wasn't like something that we just came in and just lay down. We worked in this part for a while. And um, there's nobody else that I would have wanted to execute this part than Orion. I mean, he's just, uh, he's the goat when it comes to this stuff. And, and you can hear him the playing. I mean, you know. Um, and um, he makes me sound good. I always say the best musicians make the producers sound great. You know, um, that bass setup I have, just like I talked about on the drums, this bass setup is 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 dope, you know, it's gnarly, but, you know, without a good player, I mean, I, I'm no bassist. If I played through that a whole setup, it would sound like, it would, it would sound like junk, you know, it wouldn't sound good. I mean, I, I have the constantly choosing gear that fits the player and fits the part, you know. Um, I don't know what bass we use for this. It may have been my Greco. I bet it was. I bet it was my Greco. BW because we use this on most of this record except one track. I think we used uh, a Fender Jazz, I want to say. So this was probably the Greco, which is a super, again, modern, like, uppity, mid-range sort of uh, 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 bass. But having said that, like I said, even if I was playing that, it would not sound like that. That is, that's the dude right there. Um, I'm telling you, producers out there watching this, as a producer... Know the people in the band. Know the people in the room. Play to their strengths. You know, help them with their weaknesses. I couldn't give any better advice than that, you know? Um, listen to the part. What, what are the assets of the part? Like I would said, I knew from early on this pre-chorus part was what I wanted to base, base the bass tone around, right? I knew that very early on. 
so when I sat down with him on 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 the day when we actually started to track this stuff for real and it wasn't just pre-pro demos anymore, it was like, okay, we're tracking. Um, I knew in my head that that was a part that I had him play over and over again as I dialed in because I knew that if I had that part dialed, that the rest of the song, the bass would be right in the rest of the song, you know? Um, so I use that as my anchoring of like, okay, this is where the bass needs to sit. This is what I, I want to make sure that is being highlighted. So anyway, I, I do that a lot, you know, like listen to the part, base your tone around something. Don't just throw it up because it sounded good last time. You know, I mean, I, 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 I would bet on every song on this record, we had a completely different, I had a completely different tone setting. Now, having said that, I, I probably, I, or I should say, I, I, I kept up the same, the same amp arrangement. This was there all, whatever we did, two or three days of bass tracking on, on this EP. This stayed, you know? So I got my, I picked out my, excuse me, I picked out my microphones and my pre's, and then I changed the gear, the EQ settings, uh, the EQ sounds the preamp, the EQ sounds the amp, and the actual gear and pedals that we're using. But let the microphones be the same capture. And what that does is it kind of makes the record feel, to me, uh, the low end of the record feel m together. I'm going to use the word married again, you know. Um, turn my AC on. I'll probably turn it off in two minutes again. I turn it on, I get warm, two minutes later I'm cold. You know, if you watch the channel, you know. What can I say? I'm fickle. I'm fickle. Um, so anyway, getting back to it here. Let's listen to, let's look at what I did here. Let's go ahead and re uh, let's go ahead and route this back out of my, not out of the mix bus. Mute this guy out. And let's go and tackle the D112. See what we did here. So let's listen to it. Very cool. Okay, so um, I, on the D112, I used bum, ba, da, bum, my UTA MP EQs. I used those on the first two inputs, which were the D112 and the 421. Um, and they, I, there is method in my, my, my mayhem, just like I said on the guitars. There's a reason why the UTAs were used on those microphones and not the other ones, and we'll get into that in a moment. Um, Lexi, so I am, Lexi, is there a better picture here? That's the EQ, we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, I was hoping we could see the preamp setting a little bit better, but you can kind of see I'm at mic gain, 10, 15, 20, 25 mic gain. Um, I'm setting it to the EQ. No pad on, so I was really driving this preamp, guys. I mean, like, you know, that thing's turned up. And I'm not using a pad on the D112. One, that's one, that's a uh, that's a testament to how much power and volume the D112 can take and still sound good, but also a testament to the fact that these preamps sound friggin' awesome. I mean, I'm blowing this thing up and it sounds great. Um, I'm trimming it a little bit. I don't see. It looks like. I mean, I can't see the knob, but just a just a little bit. Probably, probably it's in another picture. I'm sure that I can see the 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 trim setting. Uh, but it is in, it says uh, in, I for in, O for out. Uh, 50 ohm setting, cool. Um, the transformer's in base, that means, uh, and I probably matched my ohm setting to what the microphone is, or I might have just flipped it between the two and seen which one I like better, which is probably more likely what I did, because that's generally how I operate with those sorts of things. But no surprise, transformer is in, anytime I'm using the MPEQs, I mean, half the reason I love them is because of their, literally because of their transformer. So hitting this thing very hard, uh, and, and you can tell I'm not using a pad because I'm only using 10, 15, 20, 20 uh, down 25 in the preamp. So, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't crank the preamp because it's, it's getting a ton of volume to, to, to it to begin with. Um, cool. And then let's check out the EQ for this little dude. Let's see here. Uh, there it is. Okay. I am boosting. Oh, there's a trim, by the way. Oh, wow. I'm actually trimming it. Uh, I'm trimming a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's not a huge surprise. Yeah. Uh, so I'm. I uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. So I'm 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 trimming it down seven decibels. You know, oh, it's it's it's, uh, it's enough. It's a lot. I'm, you know, it's it's a 
It's a healthy amount. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm boosting 60. Okay, so this is the reason. So the reason that I am using uh, the UTAs on 1 and 2 is because the EQs, just like I said during the guitars, um, the EQs in these things are just rad. They sound so good. And to me, the low-end punch on these things are chef's kiss, I believe is what the kids say nowadays. Oh, she, chef's keys. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, they just sound, the low end is just so natural and um, focused, controlled, you know? So I'm boosting 3 dBs of 60 hertz with a pretty wide Q, actually. So it's probably going from like a little below 60 all the way up to probably like 100, which is, you know. Um, yeah, and then, let's see, what else did I do here? I did, oh, there we go. Okay, so, really interesting. I'm boosting 5K by 2 dB. So, not a ton, but enough for it to punch through. So, what that's doing is it's, again, tied to this mid-range push guy right here, 3K, how I'm boosting it by 7.5. What this is doing is basically driving that point home, right? Okay, I want the high mids in this base so this is boosting 3k with a with a decent q by seven and a half up there well now i'm boosting 5k by 2 dbs up there right so i'm really trying to get the mid-range out of this guy and i think we accomplished it i mean let's take a listen again yeah i mean there that's you know there's there's a controlled nice low end on that d112 but there's a healthy amount of mid-range especially for a d112 you got to remember like an SM7 has a natural amount of mid-range in it that just adds the, just how the microphone sounds. The DU-12 isn't necessarily known for its mid-range. You know, it's, it's known for its low end, which is why I'm boosting 60 on it because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take that very well, and it does. Um, so, yeah, same thing I would gander. Let's listen to the 421. Oh, let's actually see real fast. What am I doing here? Mmm, okay. Boosting 68. So this is now, this is post-tracking. Now this is in the mix. I did this. I felt as if I wanted more 68. Cool. Wanted more sub. Let's, we can take a listen to that real fast if we want. I hope you're listening to headphones because if not, that's just, that was just silence on your phone just now. I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I would doubt that an iPad or an iPhone is going to recreate 68 hertz all the way down there. Maybe I'm wrong. Um... That sounds gnarly though. That is low and is so sick. That's that's the what later we'll do it on the on the on the stem on the bass stem we'll, because uh, uh, I don't know if I boosted it or not at sixty eight on the bass stem or sixty. Or, but if not, we'll do it anyway just because I want you to hear that some of the ultra low stuff that I was talking about from the ampeg, like how it just rounds the sound out and gives us that that low end push. Um, more than impressive stuff. And one sixty was a problem. Let's check that out. Uh, that would sounds like a problem to me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's just woofy. I mean, it's probably just you know that that thing is so close and so loud. There's probably just some resonance in the cabinet at, at 160. I wouldn't be surprised if I probably ended up uh, cutting right around. Yeah, right around there on, on a lot of these microphones. Um, and that, and that's fine. You know, you find the problems, you seek them out, and you cut them out. You know. Now here's an interesting thing on this guy. I'm actually cutting at. I'm I'm, I'm doing a low pass at 4.5k. So again, as we talked about in the guitar videos, all these EQ moves are meant to be complement of one another, right? So in other words, I really want the SM7 and the M1 and the and the M81 to be my top end microphones, right? Um, and I want the D112 and the 421 to be my low end microphones, right? So. I'm boosting 68, and I'm not saying I didn't do that on the other ones, I guess we'll find out, um, but I probably didn't, if I'm being honest, if I know myself, I probably boosted low end on, on, uh, uh, on in, in the mix on the D112 and the 421, 421, because those were the, the, the purposes of those microphones, to be the low end for the bass, and the SM7 and the M81 to be the mid-range and the, and the sizzly top end stuff on the bass. So that nuts... Uh, what that does is the microphones aren't getting in the way of each other. We don't need every microphone having all the frequency range, right? I mean, generally, just picking out the right microphones, that's going to happen anyway, right? You pick out the right microphones, they're going to be centered on their 
on their favorite frequency as it is. But then with EQ, we can we can just we can dial that in a little bit more. And what do I always say on this channel, folks? Every little move counts because it gets magnified, right? That one EQ move then gets sent to my bass bus where it's compressed, and then it gets sent to my unfair chart where it gets compressed, and that gets sent back in, EQ a little bit more, and, that, and then the bass, and then the printed unfair fair chart stem that's been EQ'd and compressed gets sent to my mix bus where it's going to be EQ'd and compressed, and all these little moves that I make get amplified little bits at a time in stages, stages, little bits at a time. You know, I'm not going for gold on one channel, on one, on, you know, or, or, or one mic. Slowly but surely, we get to that answer, you know, and it is slowly, you know. Again, I say it all the time when people ask me, how do I spend 12 to 15 hours on a mix? It's like, how could I not spend 12 to 15 hours on a mix? I mean, I spent probably two hours EQing bass and getting the bass stem out, you know. That was like a couple hours. How long is that? I'm trying to think of a movie. It's, le- it's not as long as the Titanic, but it's two thirds the way of the Titanic, you know? We used to do, I used to do that um, back in uh, high school. Uh, my, my friends and I would had stupid stuff like, um, you know, like, oh, uh, how long is the day left of, of school? Like, oh, we have, we have, we have uh, two Titanics worth left, which meant that we had six hours of the day left. It's like we would use that as like the, the breeding ground for like how long something was, was uh, it's a Titanic's worth. <laughs> It's really stupid. Um, anyway, I and and uh, Jack could have fit on the door. I don't care what anyone says. She she let him drown in the movie. And if you know what I'm talking about, look it up on Reddit. It's a whole thing. One million percent, Jack could have fit on the door that she was floating on in the ocean. Like I don't know why he was sitting in the ocean dying of hypothermia. Like get him on the get him on the friggin' door you're on. I don't know. Anyway, that see, I turn away from my notes. For one minute, and I'm talking about uh, Titanic. You know, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, so let's move on to the 421. Let's listen to the 421 now with all the plugins applied. Actually, I'll take these off real fast too. Healthy amount of low end again. Oh, I didn't go over the compressor. I mean, basically, I'm just using on the D112 as well. I'm just using a Renaissance Axe, and uh, on the 421, I'll see it. It's so it's compressing down five or down six at its heaviest moment, um, which is a lot. I mean, that's pushing down pretty hard. I didn't, as you can see here uh, in my outboard chain, I didn't compress the tape. Orion again is a really consistent, great player. I want his dynamics. I don't want to smush him coming in. In the mix, I'll decide how much I need going out, but coming in, I don't. I want. I want Orion to beat Orion. You know, I trust him. Hopefully, he trusts me as well. Um, but I. But I, I. I trust him to 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 play to the dynamics that I want. Not to say that that means you just never use a compressor. Just in this scenario, I felt as though I didn't want to compress him to tape. I. I I've. I've. I want to say Orion. I bet I've never compressed Orion to tape because I. Him and I usually just go and I typically like want him to play things over and over and give me different dynamics and dramatics and then uh um of that nature but I, I definitely com- have compressed many of bassists to tape before you know um but you know you you kind of find your groove and that's as a producer too when you have session musicians where you find a groove with it's kind of a beautiful thing you know like Orion and I like he comes in and works and we kind of have a thing like just like me and Dash you know or like me and Mark or whatever like we just have like we kind of know each other you know we know our tastes. We know what we're going for. They know what I'm doing. I know what they're trying to do, and we trust each other. And I know their dynamics or whatever like that. And 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 that's typically, you know, why I want them on certain songs, and and hopefully why they want me on certain songs too. Um. So anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, at at so at peak, it's it's down six. Probably the same thing on the D112. Almost this. I mean, it's actually, I'm using the same threshold knob probably because I want the compressor basically be hitting generally the same. Um, so 421. Let's see. Um, similar EQ moves again. 67. I found. What did I do? 68 here on, on D112. Yeah. So it's like what? Okay. Yeah. So basically the same. Uh, and then 175 on this guy. So let's so let's listen here. <laughs> So 
So that's interesting because you can actually hear that 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 kind of like nasally thing that's happening in the D112 at 160 is happening at the 421 around 175. It's the same sort of tonality. And that's a great example of just why you search and destroy because it wasn't at 160 on the 421. It was at 175. Uh, just like it wasn't at 175 and the D112 was at 160, you know? You have to really know these microphones and, and or not even know them, but you have to really analyze the microphones and, 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 and seek that out. So I probably knew during mixing at that point that I was looking for that nasally sort of woofy thing that was happening on the speakers because um, it was loud and maybe one of the one of the EQ moves I did was kind of giving me a little bit over an abundance of that. So when I was doing the 421 EQ moves and uh, compressor moves, I was looking already for that sound and I found it at 175. I'd be curious to see if I did it on the SM7 and the M81 as well and and if so, where they lived and where I saw and 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 where I found that. Okay, SM7, this one's going to sound way different and here's why, folks. Oh yeah, the 421 preamps. I probably I bet they're very similar. Yeah, I mean the 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 trim is this is the 421 on the MPEQ2. Um, not as trimmed, but same mic staging, I mean, mic gain stage. And I bet the EQ is the same. I mean, it's different boosting, but same Q section and same frequency, 60, boosting at 60 and boosting 3 dBs there. And I bet I boosted, yeah, 5K, I boosted two. So that was the same EQ move there. So I wanted those two to sound similar to each other, basically. Like, you know, like, basically, because as you saw, the EQ moves during the mix, I was using them very similar. I was letting the microphones do their own work and giving them similar EQ uh, curves, both in, coming in, and then going out later, you know? Um, SM7. Here we go, folks. Go down here. I was using one of my API 3124Vs, one of my f -f 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 favorite preamps. So many, so, I, so much so that I have eight of them. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I, have, I have two, uh, I have two uh, four racks of them. I, I love them. Um, I mean, I love API in general. I mean, it's just such a rock and roll sound. You know, they just sound fucking good when you just get things loud through them. They just sound great. Um, I was padding this down 20, though. Which is interesting, because I and rather than the other guys where I wasn't padding down twenty, I was letting the preamp get more blown up. I was, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was. I'm sorry. I was, I was, I was allowing the microphone to be more blown up. In this case, I'm letting the preamp get more blown up by going down twenty and then just cranking the level and cranking the gain. I mean, you can see here, I am really hammering the gain on this and the level. Cool. EQ, 560s. Love a 560, folks. Lo, 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 love a 560. Um, okay, you can see here, interesting. Um, again, this should tell you how, you know, uh, uh, these things aren't accidents, you know. Um, I was focusing the SM7 to be the top endy mid range microphone. You can tell it here because. Am I boosting low end? No, I'm not. Not on the, not, not, not on the input, just like I thought I wouldn't be. But I am boosting. Some 4K, not a lot, a few dBs, and, some, and, then, and then some 8K, a few dBs. Now, if I'm being honest, there's probably not a whole ton of 8K up there, but there's probably some air that I wanted, more from his finger movements and his strings, and I really wanted to probably get more of the life of it, and not as much of the low end, but more of the life of Orion and his playing style. I was probably looking for that. You can already see, spoiler alert, M81, same EQ move, not a big surprise. I matched the D112 and the 421s, the SM7 and the M81s to be the same EQ moves because I wanted those both sets to work together. Boom. So let's listen to this SM7 here. You can see here, same thing as far as the, uh, as far as the, the compressor goes, right? Um, at its max, it's coming down around five or six. Again, a uh, pretty healthy amount, especially considering you're thinking every one of these friggin' microphones are getting com compressed that way. We're really getting a str we're really holding that bass down. You know what I mean? Like we're really making sure the bass stays in place. It's not loose and floppy, and it's not just playing all the place and low ends spouting out left and right and all this shit. It's staying cemented in its place, and that's what the compressors are doing. And more so when we get to the unfair trial, that's what it's really doing, right? 
Yeah, baby. Um, so the EQ, I, I brought that up. You can see here I'm cutting at 40. So I'm cutting a little bit. Or I'm starting to a high pass at 40. So I'm doing a little bit higher than these were at the D12 and 420 ones were at 30. I mean, negligible, but again, what do I say? Every move makes a difference. I'm Thursday tonight, folks, because the AC's on. What can I say? You know? <clears throat> um, looks like 200 was our problem area on the SM7. Let's take a listen to that. So same thing, right? That nasally, it's kind of uh, congested sounding, right? D112 was at 160. 421, it was at 175. SM7, it was at 200. You can kind of see uh, a pattern here. It's slowly moving up the, stereo, uh, uh, the, the frequency spectrum with each microphone. I'll be interested to see where the M81 sat. I bet right around 200 as well, folks. Um, but anyway, I, I, at this point, I had probably identified that we had kind of a congested sort of nasally tone that I wanted to get out. And I searched it out and I destroyed it on the SM7 at 200. Two hundo, baby. Um, okay. M81. We kind of already had a spoiler alert there. Um, again, just absolutely just friggin' pinning the preamp. Pinning it. Pads on, down 20. Boom. Gain stage, just gnarly. I mean, and again, this is uh this is what I was talking about. Each microphone has its own personality, its own character. I'm trying to bring that out in there and, and, and giving it to it, right? I really want these SM7 and the M81s to have a really, the API choice was on purpose because they have, again, really gnarly mid-range, really great aggression to them. And I'm driving them super hard, right? The UTAs have really great focused, clean low end, you know, um, very controlled low end. So I'm using those through the 420 and, and, and the D112 so I can get nice punchy low end out of it without feeling like it's all floppy. Have a little, have a little hangnail. A little boo-boo. Kind of hurts. <laughs> oh, boy. I might edit that out. Probably won't. Actually, I, I, I know I won't because I, I just literally put these into my editing software and then I put a title card at the back and the end and then like that's it. Like I, there's nothing. I don't really do any editing. Uh, what you see is what you get, for better or for worse, you know? You get uh, an unencumbered hour and 45 minutes talking about bass. So, yeah, you're all welcome. Um, so, anyway, M81, driving it hard, distorted. It's great. Let's listen to this bad boy. Let's bring up its settings. Uh, probably, again, around, you know, five or six. Oh, let's see. 175. Okay, interesting. So, that's where, okay, so that's where he found it was at 175. Cool. Let's listen to the cut. Yeah, I mean, it's the same. It's literally, it's, it's the same congestion nasal thing that I was getting out on all the microphones. Oh, I got an itch on my head. You're going to see my, my, my bald head, folks. You ready? Three, two, one, bald head. There we go. Wow, look at that, huh? Um, did, it, did it blind you? Was the, was the shining off my, of my bald head? Did it, did, it, did it blind you? I hope not. Um... Yeah, so you can see here, uh, no, no, no low pass, right? On these guys, on the SM7 M81, no low pass, but but a a a a a more high pass. And on the 421 D112, what do we have? Low passes, but not as much high pass. So again, focusing and mixing what I want these microphones to do and what they're doing for the part and how they're reacting to what Orion's part is and what we planned out and 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 the production choices we made and the and the tone how it's super top endy and distorted and like super fun sounding and very aggressive and mid range focused right um, cool and then we have the 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 DI I wasn't using a whole lot of this you can see here it's down twelve so I wasn't really using a whole lot of it what did I find here uh, two fifty Oh, and I did flip the phase because I think we were saying, I was saying somewhere over here that the phase was out or something on the DI. So I, uh, yeah, you can see here, I, I, I would have, I probably just, yeah, I just made it, I flipped to 180. So that's cool. Um, 250, not using a whole lot of this. We can listen to it real fast though. I 
next listen to the uh, to the cut. I mean, it's literally, it's so funny. It sounds exactly the same. Like each time, it's like it, it is it is that. So and and it may have been coming from the bass too. Uh, that tells me something. Maybe mainly because the the di has the same cut. It's up all the way to fifty, so it's coming from a different spot. But it may have been translated to the cabinet a little bit lower down at the one sixty to two hundred range. And this has the is more at two fifty. So it could have been the base. It's, it's had a or, or or the part, just the part of the neck he was on. I mean, there's so many different things that could happen. But generally, when we recorded it, the tone was. 95% there and I had to just go through mixing and I didn't do a whole lot of moves here you can see I mean these things were pretty like going through it pretty focused already you know like all the all this stuff all these bad boys all these beautiful sons of bitches they all worked for me exactly what I wanted you know because I'm not I'm not I'm not scoping this bass part you know I'm pretty much just like highlighting what I already started to highlight when I was tracking it, which is a beautiful thing. So let's go and listen to these all together now. This is what would have been sent to the unfair child. So this is the, this is, this is just the, uh, this is all five sound sources um, together now. Man, that is, I, can I just take a second to tell everybody how much I just love music and producing records? I mean, when you get a prior like that and we just play for each other so well and, uh, you know, we get the right gear and we take the right time to get the right gear and we try things out both on the part and on the things we're hooking up and you get a great track like that. And then it's out in the world for, people, world for people to listen to. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. It just There's nothing that beats it for me, I guess. I guess that's an obvious statement because it's what I do for a living. Uh, but, man, it is just, uh, it's just a really cool thing. That's all. So, <laughs> cheesy moment there. Okay, so that was all sent to the Unfair Child. Now, let's take a look. I don't, uh, I, I, I actually have the Unfair Child currently set to the mix bus settings. Um, just because I was... I wanted to listen to the drums and the bass, how they ended up on the mix. But this is what I did to them. Um, or I'm sorry, this is what I did to the bass. Honestly, I was only using the channel A. Um, yeah, I mean, I was driving quite a bit, actually, for being honest. Uh, driving quite a bit. Thresholds up. I mean, it's it's hard to say without looking at the machine, but, I mean, obviously, I, I made the moves for, uh, for a reason. Let's go ahead and put this back out of the mix bus. We'll deactivate all these guys. Because then those were all, basically, this was sent out, or the base bus was sent out to the base unfair chart print, and we get this. Let's take a listen. Actually, let's sort this out. Yes, God, that unfair child, that, ah, uh, do you hear that? Like, the bass tracks themselves sounded good. Like, I, I love how the how all the microphones and DI and everything sound together, but then sum that through the unfair child, and it's like, everything that I loved about the bass is just better. Like, the low end feels so controlled and good. And again, I mean, that's not the unfair chart. I mean, I, that's me and Orion. That's me producing the track and Orion being a great player. You know, like, it's just the bass, the low one's controlled. 
and it's focused and it you feel that modern like low end gro- gr- gr- growl that you want from a from a rock bass and then you have this this punchy mid range that's going to sit so beautifully with the guitars right and the sizzly top and where you're hearing Orion play with the strings and him sliding around and you're hearing him just have a good time on that neck right on the fretboard you hear all of that and that is just so great now let's turn on the EQ and the compressor that I have. Um, okay, so very interesting. I boosted 65 on the bus and I cut 130. I bet 130 was a summation of that nasally congested sound that there was a little bit left over. I only cut it by, by uh, two and a half. Let's take a listen to each section. So uh, low end first. I hope you're listening to this on a dope pair of monitors because that ultra low from that Ampeg sounds so good and so focused and so put together and cemented that it is just holding down that bass track so great. Bravo. I mean, everything is, everything's working. Um, 130, I bet that's uh, the, the nasally congested problem we have. Let's take a listen. Oh, wow. You can hear the unfair child, actually, the compression actually brought out that nasal congestity thing quite a bit. Um, and that, again, guy, pe- people, this is, why, this is why you have to take the time to do this in stages, right? I cut out those frequencies on every channel on the bass. And yet still, when we sent unfair child, I had to cut two and a half dBs at 130 to make sure that we carved out that congestion still. If we're not doing the work, you don't get the results. You know, if you don't take the time, if you don't get the results, that's just, there's no, there's no easy street here. There's not supposed to be. One, because you're supposed to be having fun doing it. And two, because it's supposed to be difficult and you're supposed to have to pay attention to details. And if, if it was easy, then everybody would do this. I promise, because it's fun and it's a blast. Anyway. I'm uh, high passing at 25, so basically uh, just getting any garbage or wobbly or or, uh, uh, any warbly junk down there that we don't need that's going to, you know, blurry up the image or whatever like that. We're just cutting off that stuff. Because again, you know, this isn't a sub bass, you know, it's still a bass, it's a played bass. So at most, at 60, we're starting to get some low end. But really, you saw at 65, 68, 70, 72, 75, that's where those cues are working, where we're really getting the low end. That's where that, that ultra low is really coming in. And then the and then the real the bass bass that you're hearing like that fills up the guitars, uh, uh, the guitar tracks is you know like I said like 400 to 800 really hearing that like that low mid part of the bass that everyone you know if it's not there that you know it's not there like something's missing pretty pretty obviously. Um, and you know this plays with the drums really well. Let's 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 take a listen. I had to play that through because it's just so, I mean, I want you to really be able to focus in and listen to that, how the kick drum is like punchy and low endy and there's some nice room to it. And then the bass is taking up those fat bottom end there and just filling everything up at from, from 200 to 800. And there's a nice, nice boost at the, in the, in the, in the, in the sub frequencies on both the kick drum and the bass guitar. So they're playing well together, but there's a hole carved out of the kick drum at the spot where the low mid is poking out of the bass. It works well. It, it's it's all working, is what I like to say, you know? Um, oh, my notes went off. Maybe I'll talk about the Titanic again. Jesus, I can't believe I did that. Sorry. God. Oh, let me get my password in here real fast. There he is. Um, 
I want to go over, lastly, I guess lastly, probably, yeah, lastly, I want to go over, this was being, oh, this was being sent to a mix bus, obviously, where the rest of the mix was. But today I only wanted to focus on the bass, obviously, and then and then also having the drums in here because I really wanted you to hear what I just kind of just played, how all those bass changes and how the rhythm section really carries this this song. Um, at the time when I did this record, I wasn't using that Cornef, um, the amplified instrument processor. I always forget the name of it. AIP. I was just know AIP. Um. I was using the arc compressor to kind of push down a little bit more, and we can watch this again. I'm not doing a whole lot on the bus because, you know, guys, you got to remember, I mean, it's holding it down a little bit more, but we've compressed each microphone channel 5 to 6 dBs, then we went into my unfair chart. Then we summed all of that into the unfair chart where all those were being summed together and hit probably I would gander another three down three dBs, maybe a little bit more at its peaks, but, but you know, around there. Then we're compressing it again, going to the mix bus, you know. That sounds like a lot of compression. Well, that's because it is. <laughs> but it's not collapsing, right? We're not losing low end. It's actually amplifying the low end and making it sound better. And that's what happens when, you're st when you stage these things correctly, when you do it slowly and you do it intentionally and you do it over time of the mix. I'm not slapping on a three compressors onto one channel because then your low end is going to be freaking destroyed. Like, try it. Trust me. It's, it's going to sound awful. I promise. Your low end will be eaten up. It's going to sound phasey and weird and it's going to sound – it's not going to be cool. Um, but doing it slowly and 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 carving out where the how how these compressors are working and and slowly working them into the mix, it's almost like, well, I don't want to say pizza dough because I'm a I'm a pizza fanatic, um, but when you need that pizza dough, you can't do it fast, you know, you can't slap it around and toss it in the oven. You got You got to knead it out over a little bit at a time, you know, slowly but surely that dough comes together, right, and it starts to work for you instead of work against you. It's the same thing here, right? S slowly we're applying EQ and compression, right? Throughout the mix of this bass, slowly. And it starts working with us, not against us, right? By the time we're down here, everything's starting to come together. The low end feels better. The mid-range feels better. The top end airy stuff feels good, right? But if we were to slap it all on at once, I promise you, folks, it, it's going to work against you. Heed my advice. Take the time. Do it in stages. Be intentional. Try things out. Um, but I wasn't using so I so anyway I was only hitting it maybe down two 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 maybe one and a half. Yeah, and, and not even all the time. It's really just it's just engaging when it needs to just kind of be held down a little bit more in the middle of the mix, you know. Um, but I want to point out that I wasn't using the uh, the AIP yet. I probably didn't have the plugin, or maybe I wasn't feeling confident enough for it to be in the mix, but I thought this would be a fun experiment that I, I matched the, le the, the compression level generally with what the R compressor is doing, but I'm using the, the VCA compression side of it. I'm using the proprietary signal processor, PSP, and I'm using the insufferable mid-range filter on it. And then going in here and doing and using the tone shape. Now I know it's kind of an unfair comparison because the R compressor doesn't have all those things, but that's okay because I think it's also a comparison as to why this is a better toolbox to use than the R compressor. Um, I used to do this all the time when I started making records. I would deliver a record to a band, and then like four months later, I would the record would sound eighteen times better, <laughs> you know, because I would keep messing with it behind the scenes. Um, I don't do that anymore, mainly just because I'm too busy. And instead, I'm just trying new things all the time while I'm while I'm producing records. But this is one of those moments where I'm like, you know what? I want to actually listen to the bass stem that I created with the R compressor, um, and then I uh, uh, and then I want to listen to it with the uh, uh, with the Cornef AIP on it instead, right? So let's take a listen um, to the Cornef, and then we'll kind of compare contrast. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Actually, I'm going to solo these because I think with the drums, uh, I mean, I think 
I know I'd be able to hear it, but I don't know on YouTube if you get the full right range. I mean, I think these sound pretty good on YouTube, but I want to really solo out the bass so you hear the AIP on, AIP off, our compressor on, our compressor off, and then vice versa between this. So this is the uh, corner of AIP on with these settings. Did you, God, when you turn that thing off, I mean, this is one of my favorite plugins ever. Like, legitimately ever. Like, it sounds like what I want outboard gear to sound like sometimes, you know? And it does it better some, than, than, than sometimes than some outboard gear. I'll say this, it does it as good. How about that? You can see I, I level matched so that it was compressing about the same as the R compressor, and I boosted it 1.5 dBs just like I boosted the R compressor because I wanted the... The comparison will be the same. So let's turn this off. We're going to turn the R compressor on. Sounds good. A, 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 the AIP. There's an obvious difference there, folks. There really is. Strap on some headphones, uh, and I'm going to go between the two of them now. I'm going to turn them on and off each, okay? Awesome. I mean, just awesome. Truly. I mean, for my money, see our compressor. I like that our compressor. I actually use it a lot, too. I mean, I think it's good. It's, it's, it's more neutral sounding than the AIP. I'll give you that for sure. But for something like this where – and a lot of my stuff, I want saturation. I want character. I, I want that stuff. The AIP, especially on string instruments like, like the guitars and bass that I use, I, I kind of want that character, especially when – I've been so diligent about dialing in the character and tone already that the AIP, I feel like I can use to kind of just even just give it the extra 5% before I send it to the mix bus, which is what this is doing. It's an extra kind of 5% before it goes to the mix bus. I mean, that's huge. Uh, let's hear the drums. Sick. Oh, that is sick. Um, yeah, and and I, I've gone over pretty much all my notes here. I mean, I mean, the thing I, I started to talk about right before I played that was just the 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 color and character um of the low end in your mix is really important. I achieve it by choosing microphones, blowing up preamps, sending that all that out to unfair child, blowing that up, sending it back in, using some AIP, whatever. Choose your way to do it. You know, make your music baby, make your low end theory baby. I have, that's my low end theory. You know, I like character and saturation and tone. That's the way that I bring out low end in my mixes and make the bass feel modern and growly and fun. And um, that's how I treat my bass, you know, for mixes. At least in the, I mean, again, I'm saying in mixes, but you know, I, I just like low end character, you know, and low end saturation. I think it's important for modern music, modern or specific, specifically modern rock music. Um, I have my tools in my tool box that I used to do that. Find your tools in your your tool box. Do it. Mess around. You know there it's some there's a thousand different ways to do this. My way is not right. As a matter of fact, I'm changing my way all the time. I mean, I told you when I mixed this record, I didn't use the AIP. I was using the R compressor, and eventually I evolved that that how how I treat low end in the going out to the mix bus, and now I use the AIP. You know, so it's like. You know, for a while, 
I wasn't using an unfair chart. I was using all in the box stuff or I was sending it out to 1176 instead. It's constantly evolving and changing. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. Um, well, there's no right way. There kind of is a wrong way to do it, I think. But that's a, another, it's more of a esoteric conversation, I think, for low end theory. Um, but in general, find your way to do it. Make your music, baby, you know? Um, man, I think, I think we've, covered it i don't know i probably think of another hour's worth of stuff that i didn't talk about on my drive home tonight but i feel like that's basically the gist of bass recording production and some of my low end theory and how i like to treat low end and how i think it uh what 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 i think it, it's supposed to feel and sound like inside of a rock mix you know um yeah i hope everyone's enjoyed this if you have any questions which i'm sure you will because i jump around a lot um Leave them in the comments. Follow me on Instagram at Mike Peppy Music or Twitter at Mike Peppy Music. Um, or leave a comment here. In general, just get in touch with me about stuff. I mean, I, I you know, I have a lot of videos that I can do that I want to do. Um, I hope this was helpful. Like I said, it's it's all meant to uh to 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 get you to your music child, your music baby, folks. Um, yeah, thank you guys for watching. This has been a lot of fun for me. I hope it's been fun for you. And yeah, go on and go forth. Make some gnarly low end. You know, blow some stuff up, make things loud, make it fun. You know, give it to me, babes. Give me the low end. Uh, yeah. Have a great night, evening, day, wherever you're at. And I would too. Mwah. Thank you so much, folks.